Hello, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for being here to the new educational program by the Association of Foreign Press Correspondents. I am Elena Lenza, and I'm here joined by uh, Bruna Lopes, Innovation Director, and Murillo Albanez, Future Design Leader, both of them at MJV Technology and Innovation. Small introduction about our panelists. Uh, both of them are great examples of how digital transformation can affect all the sectors in the economy. So Bruna Lopes uh, holds an MBA in digital transformation and the future, speciali the future of business, specialization in communication design and marketing at the Wilson School of Design in Canada and a bachelor's in industrial design. She has uh, developed several projects and has had the opportunity to lead and participate in innovation missions to Amsterdam, New York, San Francisco, and Hong Kong. Murillo Albanez is an expert in strategic foresight and trend research at several institutes across the world and has had experience in working with innovation projects applied to many sectors, including education, finances, energy, telecommunications, health, among others. A perfect example of digital transformation in factors impacting all the sectors. So to know you better, I have a little short question for each of you. Bruna, as Innovation Director, what do you find most fascinating and most challenging in your profession? Hello, Elena, thank you. Nice to meet you, thank you. Uh, well, as Innovation Director, I think um, facing the challenge that the world is now facing right now with a lot of changings, I think the most um, challenging um, thinking that we are facing right now is the continuously customer changing, right? So the customer are even more um, excited to new things, even more um, in touch with new technologies, um, with new brands, with new um, realities. So I think this kind of different between new um, people around, new brands around, new technologies around, and the world is kept changing so fast. I think this is the most challenge that we are that we have been facing right now, just because we need to deal with everything at the same time. And also inside in our words here, we need to help our clients, right? To face the same challenge, to keep changing, to keep growing their business, to keep getting to know better the customer, getting to know better their final clients. And I think this is the most challenging um, um, thing that we are facing today. Yeah, you have to be the guide on something that you also don't know how it's going to turn out, probably. Yes. yes. <laughs> Murillo, so this is the first time that I'm talking to a future design leader. So I want to ask you, what is that? <laughs> and how would you describe your professional job activity? This, this is a good question. Basically, the future designer uh, are professionals that explore future, future's perspective perspectives, future scenarios. And then we explore in these scenarios and the future scenarios based on trends that we observe today. We explore risks and opportunities for, for, the, for the businesses. And then based on these risks and opportunities, we design uh, business plans to avoid such, ris such risks and also get opportunities uh, explore those opportunities that we identified. So at somehow we do this travel, uh, traveling the time uh, to see what may happen in the future. We not we, we actually do not uh, predict the future, but we actually envision possibilities of future to get the business prepared for those futures, mm -hmm. starting from today. Sounds like a sci-fi movie. <laughs> yes, we have a, a little bit of a sci-fi in our profession as well. We do <laughs> well, a lot. That's great. Um, I'm excited to hear what you have to tell about our newsrooms and about our ind industry. So we're excited to start listening to your presentation. Okay, so I think I will do just a quick int introduction about our company before we jump in in, the, in our presentation here, just for you guys to know. Well, MJV, it's a consultancy, um, a global consultancy where we work with design and technology to help business to find better solutions, to, to help business to solve their business problems, right? So nowadays, uh, we do have 10 offices around the globe, 
here in the US, um, in Atlanta, but we have been traveling around. Also, we do have offices in Europe and in Latin America. Um, currently with more than 1300 employees and we are celebrating 25 years in business this year. And here, just a glimpse of the broad range of services that we are involved with. So depends on the project, depend on the challenge, the challenge that, that we have, we can combine more than one. So for example, um, we are able to provide services around business strategy and innovation and also discuss everything that is connected to the future design, uh, future design and future thinking here, technology and data, design and experience when we are talking about digital transformation and user and UI experience, agile and cultural transformation, and more um, recently, maybe three or four years from now, uh, we have been working with sustainability and the ESG transformation. So this is just to give you guys um, a glimpse of our company and uh, what kind of work we done. We do. Here we do have some clients. Um, so uh, we are uh, able to provide services for a different range of segments. So from insurance companies, finance sector, retail, and some others, just to give you an example here. And this is our agenda today. Uh, we are planning to cover in the next minutes, in the next hour, uh, those, those topics here. So Murilo will cover from the top trends, changing how news is consumed until the how the news of the future can innovate for today's consumers. So um, I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. So I will take from here to start walking uh through this this presentation so i will start with the top trends changing how news is consumed so this is basically a hand-picked uh behaviors that are changing regarding how people consume news okay so the first one that i'd like to highlight is the decline in the news consumption and this decline in the news consumption uh driven by anxiety and this anxiety influenced, specifically influenced by the pandemic continuous broadcast and the bad news that came with in, within this time that had put some people away from this news. So basically is people feeling uh, overwhelmed with bad news, overwhelmed with information, and they are trying to isolate a little bit from, from, this, from the source of, of, of news and specifically bad news. There is still a, a term that is doom scrolling that really tries to translate what that means. So this activity of spending a lot of time looking at your phone or at, at your computer, reading bad, bad or negative news stories and how this really drives anxiety on, on readers. And it uh, isolates them from searching for news. We have data that support us to understand and see this. For example, uh, we had research that uh, tells us that uh, the overall time in the internet is down by 30% uh, after uh, the record usage during the COVID lockdowns. So we had a peak during the COVID and now we have this decrease in time span online. At the same time, we had the research that it was carried on with uh, a lot of with about 300 uh, media outlet leaders worldwide and 58% of them uh, affirmed that they are reporting a failing or static online traffic from 2021 to 2022. So here we see that in the even in the online realm, that is this space uh, for consuming news uh, that many people use, not only the physical, we have this uh, decrease in the traffic within the, this new media outlet websites. At the same time, we see uh, as a movement of, of influencing the behavior of news consumption is the fall in the press confidence. And I believe that is common not only for US, but for Brazil and many countries around the world. Uh, that is based, that is uh, influenced by these frequent attacks towards media outlets, journalists in polarized societies. And we have news specifically in US that support us in seeing this. For example, uh, 
uh, a research from Gallup and Knight tells us that only 26% of Americans have a favorable uh, opinion of the news media, while 53% hold an unfavorable view. So this data supports us on seeing this. And we have this chart in the, in the right here that is very interesting at talking about the polarization in societies. And this chart uh, from Adam and Trust Barometer uh, tells us what society as the, are the less polarized to the most polarized. In the most polarized, you have Colombia, US, so, uh, South Africa, uh, Spain, Sweden, and Argentina. And one thing that is interesting here that uh, one of the four topics that they analyze to measure how polarized a society is, is battle for truth. So when we have uh, political actors or business actors or whatever, uh, who, who is using, uh, who is building narratives and is building stories and selling them as truth uh, from both of sides, this polarization uh, actually increases. So this is, 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 and it's pretty interesting because this battle for truth has everything to do with, with the news consumption, with the search from, from, from information. And one thing that uh, is driven by this falling press confidence is another behavior that we observe it, that is this autonomous user. So people are looking for information uh, by themselves and looking for basically what they want to see, if we could put it this way. So we have uh, news consumers looking for news in, the, in their way, either in search engines or social media, they are looking for topics and looking for information that at some at somehow relates with their worldviews somehow. And this has really uh, driven, for example, this data here, this is very interesting, that tells us that people in US prefer in the last in the last in the last two years, prefer the search, uh, the, search, the search engines and the social media to look for information. Not, not exactly prefer, but has, has increased the number of people using search engines and social media to look for information. And they are using less news website and ads. So they are, and, and it makes the case for us to understand how people are looking for information by themselves at, at somehow. And when you talk about how we can innovate and how we can bring a new, a new perspective for this, for, for these consumers looking for, uh, for news in the social, in social media, for example, we have new platforms that supports us in understanding such cases. One, ex one of the example is Post, that is this, this new media platform uh, that supports us on reach these uh, autonomous users. So uh, basically Post is uh, journalism, a journalism focused platform where you have like a, a, a free subscription that you read some, some articles with this free sub subscription and also a premium subscription. And with this, uh, premium subscription, uh, you have access to premium publishers. So we have, for example, Reuters uh, here in this uh, as a, a premium uh, publisher in this, in this platform. And then to each article that you read, you spend some, some cents uh, with uh, reading this article. So you pay for the news that you want in a social media platform, in a social media format. And this is very interesting because uh, it drives people to consume like in the in a social media way and also monetizing the, the, the platform. And one thing that is interesting specifically about this, this social media as well, it is that they bring this, uh, this uh, feeling, this, this opportunity of hear from, expert, from experts, ask, ask questions and share your opinions. So they try to create a space where people uh, search for the, the, the news by themselves, but also where they can uh, share information, share their thoughts in a welcome space. But not everyone wants to pay to read uh, news. And this is an important question. Uh, and it's an important point as well. 
And here we, we talk about this paywall controversy, if we can uh, say this way, but is with the increased inflation, pressure in prices and uh, unlimited online information, readers are not exactly opting to pay to access news. So this is something that I believe that uh, you have a red uh, feeling for, for some time. And we have data that also supports this, this, this view. So uh, another, uh, another uh, research from Gallup and Knight tells us, uh, ask, actually ask the, 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 in the survey, if the people have ever donate money to a news organization or pay to a sex news. Uh, Search for paying to a subscription or an article or buy a new magazine. And the great majority, 72% of them, said that they have never paid to a sex news. In the other side, if we ask them if in the future they would be willing to pay for news, another majority also say that they are not willing to pay for news. So, so 56% they uh, mentioned they will, they will, that will, they will not pay to, to read news. And in the same, in the same uh, research, uh, readers also mentioned that they believe the best way for, for uh, media outlets, for media uh, companies to be funded is by advertising. So we have this, this, all this, uh, this information and all these layers of how people believe the funding and the access to, to news would happen. Great. F after this hand-picked uh, changes in behavior, I'd like to go and talk a little bit about, to, to go in deeper and talk a little about of threads and opportunities for, for media in the digital landscapes. And we have Neil brought a glimpse of how artificial intelligence are actually relating and, and influence the threads and opportunities for media in the future. The first, the first uh, movement that I'd like to highlight here is how autocracy threatens freedom of expression. I believe that is something, uh, it is very related to the present, the, the, to the fall in the press confidence that we have been, that we seen uh, earlier. But here it talks specifically about the growth of autocratic governments and how their use of technology amplify the scope of media censorship. And here, the AI, the, the artificial intelligence, and their role in the world, that is like a hot top that had been discussed for, 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 for a while, specifically this year, we see how the AI can be used to legally monitor citizens, public communications, independent journalists, and really threatening the digital authoritarianism and the censorship. And we have a data from, from a research uh, from the University of Gutenberg that points us that about 72% of the world's population, about 6 billion of people, live in some kind of autocracy now. So even if this is auto elect electoral autocracy or uh, an, a fully autocratic government, but somehow people are living in this, more people are living in, this, in these countries, in countries ruled by autocracies. If we compare, for example, uh, with 10 years ago, we see an increase of 46%. So it really warns us and bringing this, 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 this point of view on how autocracy, on how uh, autocracy and artificial intelligence and new technologies, specifically artificial intelligence that we talk here with their possibility of monitor, uh, illegally monitor citizens can both create uh, a threat to freedom of expression, a greater threat for freedom of expression. At the same time, we, we see this rush of misinformation. And at some, at some point, we can talk not only about misinformation, but about disinformation as well, right? So not only from information, fake information that is spread uh, deliberately, that is the disinformation, but fake information that is also uh, spread without the intent to, to, to do some harm that is this, this misinformation. But we can see like the rush of faking news uh, going, uh, being spread all over the road very, very quickly. 
And we have seen recently in the last weeks, the pics, uh, the pictures from uh, Donald Trump being arrested. And also uh, the Pope wearing this, uh, this fluffy uh, coat <laughs> uh, that really and every, and many people actually believe those were, were reals and share this information, share this, this pic. Uh, even for example, yesterday I saw someone resharing the, the pic from the Pope, even uh, currently, even today. So we see how this fake news with specifically those, those images that were created with artificial intelligence tools to create the images, how they can be so close to reality and how they can be so plausible at the same time that they spread very quickly. And we have a data uh, that supports us in understand this. Uh, uh, I study for MIT tells us that we, we, I studied with MIT and Twitter, tells us that false news stories are 70% more likely to be retweeted than true stories are. So actually the, 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 the chance of a fake news spread is, is wider. And we, and, we, and we have also the artificial intelligence being used as we see here to create the, the, the fake news, then to create the, here the synthetic media, the synthetic uh, image, but also being used to spread this news. For example, being used uh, to manipulate and to manage fake profiles in Twitter and other social media and spreading very quickly those informations. So technology to create and to spread. And Murilo, if you may, I think this is going to be one of the biggest challenges um, that we need to face right now, just because um, it is, it's going to be not, uh, not out of control because we already have seen a lot of discussions around the AI and around those um, tools. But I mean, how can we will ensure that we are providing um, accuracy and uh, a real information that is not fake, that is not something that is, how we will prove that is not fake? How we will prove that this is not something that is made um, with AI tools or made with uh, the worst of the intentions? So I think those is gonna be, uh, this is gonna be one of the biggest challenge that we need to face um, right now and also in the future. Yes, you're right, Bruna. And what we feel now in this case shows us and it is that we are the regulation of AI and these grad rails that you mentioned that uh, put the limits are still lagging behind compared to the technology speed, right? So this is, we have noticed this and we have this point that this is the time to have this difficult conversation, as you mentioned, Bruno, that we have, that we need to have these conversations on how to assure uh, that we can uh, differentiate what is a, a fake uh, uh, synthetic media from a real uh, from a real article or a real image and etc. And we have a recent uh, case for this uh, that was that open letter from business uh, from business uh, from people from business world from uh, specialists uh, in AI in, in AI uh, and other from historians, from many people around the world, many important people around the world, uh, claiming to pose this giant AI experiment. So this was a letter that was uh, assigned, for example, from by Elon Musk, by uh, other uh, AI specialists, that they actually claim for companies, for example, as OpenAI, that is behind the chat DPT, the so-called the, the so-called chat GPT and behind the chat D, the GPT four to stop the tests with those big uh, platforms with those big AI models, uh, and they claim this to for for us to get a time to develop and implement uh, safety protocols on advanced AI and design and develop what can be audited and how to oversee this, the, the use of AI. We can have uh, critics and regarding 
what what are the what is behind the scenes regarding this open letter so what is the intent for example from big from big from big uh from big figures like uh elon musk but uh one thing that i that i believe is important that really relates what with what bruno mentioned it is uh, this just th this letter brought the the discussion of we need to regulate ai and this needs to be uh, faster than we are doing so it brought this discussion to public and somehow made people uh, reflect on it so i believe this is important by uh, uh, from this point of view and we have uh, for example some countries and some uh, institutions already working on it for example europe uh, European Union is working in a legal framework uh, to regulate uh, artificial intelligence. So it is a very comprehensive uh, legal framework to regulate uh, the use of artificial intelligence, uh, how it goes to the market. And this is like one of those movements that we have not seen uh, regarding the compre how comprehensive this 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 legal framework is we have not seen like this as a very uh, aligned movement in other parts of the world as we have seen with the with this act with the ai act that must be launched during this year yet but if we talk about bad things regarding ai we also can talk about good things and how can ai ai help journalists and even help fighting the missing the disinformation the misinformation and here we talk about human and machine so we talk about how human intelligence and machine intelligence can work together to uh, fight for to fight this information uh, when we talk about the role of ai in fighting for disinformation uh, we talk about uh, this technology working with content uh, with content analysis so these algorithms can check for the words in an article in a text uh, how they are positioning how what is the connotation from this from these words to understand if there is some kind for example of hate speech uh, behind this 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 piece of text and somehow this the the algorithms can uh, reverse engineering manipulating images and video to understand and to check if they are uh, deep fakes and an interesting case that shows us how it works is the facto the facto is a company and startup that was recently bought by yahoo and they uh, they rate uh, articles uh, based on four on four topics on four pillars to understand if they are being informative or if they have some kind of uh, misinformation or some kind of bias uh, uh, behind this. So they, this is an algorithm that analyzes the quality of the site, the, the quality of the media's outlet, uh, website, the expertise of the author, the quality and diversity of the sources, and the tone of writing. So based on these four topics, uh, the, the, the artificial intelligence can uh, give a, a grade for this article if they are uh, more or less informative and this is an interesting uh, uh, website i don't know if you have already the chance to 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 access this but you can access and they compare even for example if a news uh, they compare how uh, how a news is being communicated by several uh, media websites so they compare how they if if they are for example if they have a left or right bias or a right or, a right or left uh, inclination. So they can understand this based on these four topics. And if it, in one side we say about the machine intelligence, we need to say also about the human intelligence. And here we talk about enhancing the human critical thinking as an essential tool to together for together with the machine intelligence uh, fight the misinformation. And we talk about uh, that this education of the masses and that AI won't be successful alone. So this is important. And even, uh, and I think this is a great, uh, a great point, even when we ask other questions regard, regarding the role of artificial intelligence. 
the artificial intelligence works better when humans work with it. So this is the point here that we'd like to bring here. And the NewsGuard is an interesting case as well. The NewsGuard is a platform that is, that, uh, is based on, uh, human, uh, on, on humans, on journalists that also uh, investigate a news, investigates investigate an article and gives a grade for this article, the NewsGuard, to understand if, this, uh, if there is some kind of misinformation, the same way as the fact of works, but with human, with journalists behind it. And the NewsGuard has established a partner, a partnership with the American Federation of Teachers. It was the by the end of last year uh, to offer the NewsGuard to offer this this tool that can be accessible, for example, uh, through an extension in your web browser. Uh, to offer this to the educators and the students, and also at, at some point at their families as well, uh, to uh, with the free access to NewsGuard to understand and to investigate, to improve the quality of the news, and also to stimulate the critical thinking as a way to, to stimulate the critical thinking regarding uh, the news consumption, to identify what is fake, what is this information. And talking about opportunities as well, as well here, not, not so much about artificial intelligence, but uh, it also, uh, it's, in, it's, it's important to, to highlight this, is this movement that we have seen of putting the consumer at the center in the, in the news industry. So this, that same research with, uh, with uh, media outlet leaders uh, tells us that these leaders are exploring audio and video formats as, the, as their big bet in how to communicate and how to distribute uh, the news. So we have here in the, in the left, uh, a chart that tells us where publishers will be putting more resources this year, more resources in 2022. And podcasts and, uh, and digital audio, newsletters and digital video were the main, uh, the main, uh, the main destinies of, of funding for, for, for these industry leaders. And we see also here in right how consumers use some of social media uh, currently to take information. And it says something interesting. For example, we see Twitter and Facebook with a higher, uh, with a higher percent of people looking for mainstream news outlets and mainstream journalists if we compare to TikTok, for example. We have 31% in Twitter. 28% in Facebook and 14% on TikTok. So I do not have people on TikTok that is basically a video platform looking for mainstream news outlets and mainstream journalists. And this can be seen as opportunity uh, because we have in this, in this, in this, in this platform, uh, in majority uh, Gen Zers, so uh, Gen Zs, uh, so, uh, Generation Zs and millennials as well that are really using this platform. And they actually, and this is important because they make part of what we can uh, highlight as the digital super users. These digital super users, they are basically also Gen Zs and millennials, are those super users that do everything online. They are always online. Uh, they are in the majority brand advocates, highly attuned to new products and, serv and services, and extremely comfortable in being online and sharing information online. And these digital super users are raising the bar on how news is created and distributed, on how news, uh, or for example, uh, on how news can be uh, communicated and distributed uh, by video. So they are they rise, they raising the bar on how, uh, this can be done and introduce new, new formats and introduce and pushes for new formats as well. We have here in the, in the right corner, uh, one thing that is interesting about putting the consumer at the center and talking about this, this digital users, uh, that is this uh, user needs model of the, uh, of the readers. And here we bring an, an official user needs model of the New York Times. So this user needs model basically 
mentions what consumers, what readers want from the news, from, from the news they read. For example, we have people that want to that want the, the, the information to make their life easier or to, or to enrich their life, connect with ideas, make their think, uh, catch them up. So each they, they are jobs to be done, let's say this way, with uh, all the all the information they consume. And also the media outlets can use this job to be done, what the consumers want by the end to, to understand and to create content and to distribute content in the best way it's possible. So for example, when we talk about make me think here in this example from the New York Times, uh, they, they are talking about writing articles and writing uh, information and providing information that, that is thoughtful. When we talk about connecting with ideas, uh, they mention about uh, providing content uh, with the interpretation of facts. So each one of the, of the needs of the readers are at somehow being met by this, this, this framework. And this is very interesting. And it's a way to put the consumer at the center as well. It is, uh, let me just uh, ask you one question, Rio. It's very interesting. I didn't know about this uh, user needs model. Uh, but probably New York Times, if they have this knowledge, they are also using this model in order for every job, as you said, every job by the information to be done, um, to have a different duration or maybe have a different format to, so they know if uh, the article should be longer, the reportage should be longer or smaller, right? Yes, yes, exactly. It, it also, de uh, it also uh, determines if the, the length of, of, of content, how it is uh, communicated and distributed, etc. This is, uh, uh, I would say, like an unofficial uh, user need from, from the New York Times uh, that uh, actually we have seen this, uh, we, we have captured this in a research, in a, in a, in a report from uh, Reuters and, uh, and the Oxford University as well, uh, where this exactly this is the point to each job to be done they mention uh, they actually think in a way to provide the best information in the best way it's possible Marilu, um before you move forward i just want to mention also that this kind of discussion also opens space uh, for us to discuss about the generation the generational changes right because here we are talking about new technologies, everything 100% digital, all the AI, and how they are mixing and matching with our lives. But also, we know um, that we need to discuss how to deal with the difference between the generations, right? And how to also be inclusive and avoid creating an even more um, significant generational gap between people there is, well, um, 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 elderly people, um, and then how we can also include them in this kind of discussion, and not, and also try to avoid this kind of well, this is well, this is what it is, all digital, all new technologies. Um, you need to adapt. I don't think so. I think this also these discussions raise um, attention to this kind of generational changes and. How can we be more inclusive also um, taking into account that we do have a lot of different challenges to face right now? I just want to point that out. Great. Yes, I think it's, it's a good point, right? Uh, not, not everything, the digital does not work for everyone, right? Great. And now uh, I would like to explore a little bit how the news of the future can innovate future-based consumers. And now we bring some cases from the future, some cases on how uh, media outlets, uh, small or big media outlets are using uh, emergent technologies in their, in, their daily, in, their daily, in their daily life. So we have seen with this case from the future that those companies are leveraging the technology to take innovation to, to the day life. And this is a, an interesting case for a digital twin 
uh, we use it to communicate break news. This is a digital twin of uh, an anchor from the cable channel in South Korea, MBN. And they use this, this, this anchor, this digital anchor, only to, to broadcast breaking news. So they, this is a AI powered version, AI digital powered uh, uh, version of, of, the, of the anchor that was trained with the anchor tone of voice, with the anchor uh, way of talking. And they replicate this in the digital world. Uh, and it, one thing that was very interesting is that a lot of people were surprised with this. Some people liked it, some others did not like it. And many of them asked if the, the anchor, if Kim Jo Ha would lose her job. And the, 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 the cable channel mentioned, no, she will not lose her job. Uh, the, her, her digital version, her digital twin will be used only for breaking news. She, she, will kept, she will keep with her activities regularly, uh, not only, only for breaking news that her digital version would come, come on in the, to play. We have seen how, uh, also how this use of new technologies can push, can push beyond the current business model, can push the media outlets to find new ways of, of, uh, of monetize, of, of generate, uh, generate uh, resources. We have James that is, that is called like a digital butler. The James is basically a solution based on AI, so AI powered as well, that came from the Times of London with, with Twipe, both of those, those companies part, uh, partner to create, uh, to increase the number of subscribers, uh, creating personalized newsletters, personalized content, personalized uh, uh, web pages. So this, Algorithm understand what, what is the main topics that the reader uh, has interest and create the ideal content for each one of those subscribers. And one thing that is important here, and now pushing the, the, the current business model, is that they, uh, they started to offer this as a product to other, to other companies. So here, the, the Times of London not only uh, is a publisher uh, at, this, at this point, but also offers a product uh, that is based in the, this AI software. And all this, all this, uh, all this, this point, all these technologies and innovations can create a win, a win win game with the consumers. So, a game where everyone uh, everyone actually wins. And this is a case for Snowball. We have seen the controversy of the, the paywall and that not exactly everyone wants to pay to a sex news. And we have this solution for Snowball that is a newsletter about finance, a French, a French, a French newsletter uh, that created three paywall possibilities, three levels of, of paywall. And in the last level of paywall, the most expensive, you have advantages beyond accessing uh, other contents and additional contents. You also have the opportunity to have some discount on tools of financial control uh, and on tools that are used and mentioned in the in the newsletter and that are used in the uh, in the news in the finance literacy and etc. So it is a way for you to get like uh, additional an additional perk from subscribing uh, the the most expensive paywall. We also have have uh, media outlets and we have. Uh, journalists exploring the digital world, the, and here specifically the metaverse, to, to create engaging stories. And this is very interesting as a case for, uh, from the Center for Collaborative Investigate, Investigative Journalism, that they created uh, a world, they created a space in the metaverse where they publish some of their stories. So you can enter in the metaverse and, and access the story and Get in touch with the information and understand their their uh, what they are producing, 
instead of going to a website and to read like a long a long page or uh, even like a physical published uh, uh, a, a channel or as as a journal and etc. And by the end, this uh, emerging technologies let the readers be in the editorial board. And this is a very interesting case uh, related to blockchain and Web3. That is 20 Minutes. 20 Minutes is a magazine that was funded by the purchase of NFITs. So everyone that holds an NFIT, every NFIT holder has uh, the opportunity to, to participate and choose what articles and what and what speakers would be uh, in the in the magazine. So it is a way for bring the consumer together with the the, the editorial board and let them participate. Let, let the readers participate in the definitions of of the of the magazine of the of what is being created of the content and this being created. And this was very the the this version of the of the the twenty minutes. The all the NFITs were sold out in like a few hours, uh, with not a small price, almost three hundred euros. But it also points out how uh, what could be those other ways to engage with the consumer. What could be those other ways to bring the consumer uh, together to build the content and to to engage. With with the with the with the company with the the the, the news media outlet and here to wrap up and to give like a to le to leave a provocation I would like to to bring this question after everything you have gone through how. Do you envision the newsroom of the future? Which of these opportunities, which, which one uh, of these uh, threats really can influence the, the newsroom of the future? What do you feel the most? What, which one of those uh, innovations can be applied in the daily life? So it is a way to start a conversation and reflect about the, how to envision the newsroom of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Murillo. Um, thank you very much, Murillo, again. Um, can you, uh, before we start the conversation again and before you stop with the screen sharing, can you show us your contacts for both of us, how we can reach you? Sure. Yes, you have showed us uh, immense uh, um, content, immense, very, very useful content that even I didn't know. Um, so yes, let's start with the um, with the questions. Here are your emails, and thank you very much for both being. Um, it was, as I said, a very useful presentation. Thank you very much. I was very impressed by a lot of the things, and I could say that the most um, I don't know, shocking, but a little like I was very impressed with the Korean news anchor that will appear every time there are breaking news. Uh, I think we have to understand and the channel has to understand if that's really useful, if that will not freak out their own users. Um, and I, re I again once also want to go back to what Bruna said that the generational uh, division can be there and it's very important to also be um, aware of different parts of the audience and be aware that not everybody will have the same resources. And just that just makes me think of how some months back or maybe a year back, uh, all the phones were going to go from 4G to 5G. And I was using a phone that was not able to have any 5G. So my my phone was not even receiving any calls. <laughs> and, and that made me think like, what if I didn't have the money to buy a new phone right now? Or what if older people don't know how to do that? What is going to be, uh, what, what is going to happen? <laughs> um, so I wanted to maybe, ask some questions to you too, um, for both of you, maybe Bruna uh, starting. Can we say that from the consumer point of view nowadays, um, the news cannot be without digital tools? Because I mean, a large amount of people don't, don't really access the traditional media anymore, radio, television maybe, 
Um, so if it wasn't for techno uh, technological advances, a lot of people would not know what news are happening around. Yeah, I think, I mean, um, when we are talking about the difference between the generations, I think we are all moving forward to adapt and to adopt um, digital tools in our daily daily um, lives. Um, I think you are right when you're talking about, for example, wow, wow, I don't have the phone uh, where I can access the 5G or um, a more um, recently connection um, uh, um, um, offering, but how people will um, consume, how people will get in touch with the news, how people will do it um, without access to digital tools. Uh, we don't have, well, we do have newspapers yet, but we don't have the as much as we um, had yes, in the past. Not so uh, it, it's not, yeah, it's not something that it's gonna, it's easier than it was before. So um, I'm just, I'm really concerned about how people will consume without um, digital access. And you are right. We are not talking about only generational changes, but we are also talking about resources. Um, uh, we are talking about, um, economics and how how some people can access and some people don't don't uh, cannot access the 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 information that is outside there. Um, but I think this is also uh, if we stop and reflect about the past, we have been facing um, different transformations and we have been facing this digital transformation for a while right now. So how can we also um, thinking about in an inclusive inclusive way? to make it possible to everyone to access real and good information that is not fake, but also um, not only um, throughout digital um, tools. I don't, I don't actually have this, uh, <laughs> this answer right now, um, but I have been, I have been um, reading and, um, some um, similar situations, right? So for example, for those who don't have internet access, for those who cannot access um, websites and, and social medias, how they are consuming information, how they are getting in touch with their world right now. They are using um, public, public spaces. They are using um, different technologies that is uh, still available. They are counting with um, nonprofit organizations, they are accounting with different companies, institutions. So I think we need to put together those different uh, perspectives, not only the consumer, but also the companies, but also the institutions, but also the government to thinking about how can we provide that to everybody, not only using or accounting with the digital tools that we have available or with the paid solutions. Murilo showed us a lot of different business models, right? Some of them are, are paid solutions. So how can I do it if I don't have the money? How can I do it if I don't have internet access? How can I do it if I'm not super digital? Those things, I think they, they are all over the table right now because we don't have the answers right now. I don't know, Murilo, uh, if you have something to add here. I think you use that perfectly. I think there is this space of I think the 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 digital discussion and the new technology they kind of uh, absorbs all the discussion at, at some point and for for some for, for some decision makers. But we also have to take a look and maybe we do not have the full uh, the full answers on how the how to do this for the other side. So. I think we, that's the, why we need the critical thinking, point. as you said, <laughs> the exactly. the critical thinking for the education. And uh, I want to comment a little bit on that uh, paid solution that both Bruna uh, just uh, re reminded us now and that you had in your presentation, Rio. Uh, one thing is a lot of people will not be able or will not be um, available to pay anything they do not want to. Another thing is that if um, there are a lot of uh, media places where you can get information. So uh, many subscribers could be very uh, loyal to one of the pages and they want to read one other article from another page, uh, um, but they won't be uh, paying for that particular article. So there's the competition. It raises also the question of competition, like how do we get the readers from our competition? 
how do we get the readers to come to our website instead of going to the other website because there are people who do not want to pay for for reading but there are also the ones who are going to pay how uh, do they choose where they want to pay so that's another uh, a little bit of a problem for the newspapers i would say um do you have any knowledge in that area <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we can also discuss the value proposition, right? Because this um, paid models, this paid business model or subscriptions is going to be, I don't want to say it's going to be, well, can be compared this the streamings that we have right now with different um, uh, TV streaming channels, right? So you are, they are targeting some um, customers, they are targeting um, some kind of um, profiles of people. So Different people are paying for different TV streamings right now, channels. Uh, so I think it is the same here. Uh, what is the value proposition and who is the target? Uh, because, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking uh, thinking that the maybe the majority will not pay for the subscriptions to have like a personalized um, information content, but some of them will. And if we do have already this kind of service being um, offered, that is because we do have um, people to consume, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there is a, a, a good thing to, to discuss is about how to raise attention, how to get the attention of the public, how to get the attention of the audience. And this is the, the, the fight of the, uh, the century, right? Because the brands are fighting for attention. The social media are fighting for the customer attention. Now the, also the um, broadcasts and also the media channels are fighting for um, customer attention. So this is something that is um, um, super interesting to discuss around the value proposition, what we are offering to who and why we are offering that. Um, what is the value that we are creating here and how we can reach out to those customers and also be um, more customer centric? How can we better understand their needs? How can we better understand what they want? And then we can create our campaigns, our services, our products around that. Uh, and I think this is what we are, what is happening right now. And it's going to be like a scale uh, situation uh, because it, it's going to be like, now they are trying to start this subscriptions, but then we we'll probably will have high personalized um, solutions coming um, to 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 where the consumer can also um, be part of it. Um, but I don't know. I think that this is gonna be a, a fight for attention, and it is gonna be for everybody, all the brands, all the all the subscription channels, all the TV and streaming channels, uh, because this is uh, what we are offering right now. A lot of information, super accelerated uh, acceleration in the world. So we are fighting for attention here. We are fighting for your two seconds of attention to see something, engage with that. So yeah, this is also interesting to discuss. What do you look just like? to complement here and and i think that everyone is fighting attention with every everyone it's like the 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 media outlets are fighting attention with also the 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 streaming and the social media platform is like a cross fighting for for this attention right and i think that uh, relating a little bit what 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 we see in the presentation have gone through that put the consumer at the center and talk about the user needs understand their uh, the what they want with the news they are reading this all, i i believe all this make part of improving the value proposition of refining the value proposition as bruna said mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that come to mind uh, when you all say these things uh, the first one I wanted to say is uh, it was very useful to know about autonomous users and uh, knowing that everybody can really choose what they're going to read. Um, and everybody then wants to have an opinion, wants to comment, and then they want to see their comment being the first one <laughs> being uh, pinned by the, uh, by the um, news media company. And uh, inside the social media news, co news companies are also fighting with those influencers, <laughs> with everybody user, every user on Instagram uh, is scrolling and scrolling and every user can accumulate like 
thousands of people they are following and, and pages they are following. Not everything will, will come uh, to their page initially. Um, so I also wanted to go back to that um, concept of super user, uh, which is at that point, I, I thought if, if that meant something as an influencer, but it probably doesn't, right? <laughs> Yes, exactly. Not necessarily an influencer, not necessarily uh, someone that is creating content by themselves, but someone that is really uh, that that really pays attention to influencers. That really plays a, not as th those super users really pays uh, pay attention to influencers to the content being generated and are online a great part of the time. But not necessarily they are influencers by themselves, mm -hmm. but they have a look at the influencers people can feel good that if they are not influencers they're still super users <laughs> <laughs> super people um another thing i wanted to ask was um about these value propositions that we uh, everybody's trying to put uh, forward so we can see a lot of companies and news uh, websites building new new things and then uh, following each other so i wanted to ask you both as strategizers how viable it is to for one uh, company to follow what others are doing just because they are doing it. Is it is it good to like to modernize in that way without really understanding if that's what it works for your business? I think that well depends on what you want. What is the the company's and the business goal, right? Some of the companies, they want to be the disruptors. They want to be the early adopters. They want to um, they wanna show to the world that they are the first one to use, the first one to show, the first one to engage with that technology or engage with that solution. But some of the companies, they are up to follow. Uh, okay, so I already saw that it's, it's, work, it's working. Uh, it's good. And I think that now I'm prepared to follow the follow the trend or follow the solution or even copy and paste and try to change a little bit to target their own audience. So I think that depends on the, the, the business goals that you have. I think, of course, that in the world that is always changing and changing so fast, the ones that is there are the first ones or the early adopters or the ones that are launching new things, um, um, they are probably being more uh, uh, they are able to influence more the market or influence more uh, what people are um, consuming or what people want, right? But I think that it's not about, maybe it's not about um, what is the bad side of um, copy or uh, follow mm -hmm. someone else. I think it depends on the business that you are, what do you want as a business? What is your goal as a business? Because we 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 do know some companies that this is their um, this is how they position themselves. They don't want to risk first. They don't want to be the first one to 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 try something or to show to the world that they are using something. Um, they want to follow the market, and I think that's fine. Uh, I think the 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 question is. What do you want as a business? What is your goal as a business? And what is the place that you want to be? Because sometimes we just don't want to take the risk. And in order to uh, experience a lot of the things that we are talking about here, you need to be you need to be open. You need to be uh, you need to be open to the risk that it comes with the with this with these new technologies or with these new um, services that is around us. Just to compliment, I believe that bandwagoning does not come without risk as well, because uh, if you, I think that beyond this first question that Bruno mentioned of what the business wants, I believe that we need to understand what the consumer wants from the business as well, to, because at some point bandwagoning just will be as risky as trying something own you at some at some point. So I believe this is the second question of looking at the consumer, looking at the consumer, understand what, what they want is important as well. Mm -hmm. We are getting a little bit uh, out of time, but uh, out of this, I wanted to ask two last questions uh, after the presentation that again was with a lot of content that some of us do not dominate, even, even journalists who work in the industry. 
what do you think are the uh, most special skills or the most important skills for the journalist to, to learn right now, um, besides the good practices of being a good journalist? And the second question uh, for both of you also is um, when people get uh, excited about trying new ideas, but then they get discouraged because they do not have the finances or they do not have the, the possibilities or the resources, uh, what do you tell them? Maybe starting with Maria. Great. So uh, when we think about the skills of, of a journalist, I would say not specifically skills, uh, I skew specifically, but I think, for example, openness to understand on how to work with emerging technologies, with the changes there, there are coming. I think, for example, we have talked a lot about artificial intelligence during our presentation. This is a very hot topic. But uh, how we can, how journalists can imagine to understand, to try. I think openness is is a, a good could, could be like a, a good a good skill in the sense to how can they understand uh, how can they understand these technologies and experiment with them in uh, actually in a in a safe zone to grab value from this relation to grab value to take value from this from this from this relationship uh, with new technology so i think that this openness from this space and to understand it's a, a, a good first step mm -hmm. and telling about uh, if you find in your in your job you find people who want to implement something but are a little bit discouraged because they don't know how to what do you tell them this is this is a good question you think to actually to understand to look for help and try to understand where you want to be how what do you want to achieve i think there are additional questions beyond i want to implement and test something that need to be checked before moving on mm -hmm. and i think that that is the way to 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 move and to give it this next step thanks yeah, I think so. I think you can, well, start small, you know, choose one idea, understand how can you start small and test it out and prototype with a small audience, with a, with a small and less um, resource. Uh, sometimes we don't have to spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resource to try it out and exper experiment on one idea. Thinking about what is the minimum that you need to do to try to test this concept, this idea that you have to try to experiment and collect feedback? Talk with your family, talk with your colleagues, talk with your uh, coworkers, start small, test it out, prototype, and then you can improve, then you can make it um, bigger. And I think the last one that I wanna say is Keep being people, you know, because only humans can bring the human aspects around everything that we have been discussing here. So keep bringing the human aspects, keep being uh, like people because machines can help us, can leverage and can um, um, uh, potentialize our work, but they cannot substitute us. So how can we bring and make sure that we are bringing and we are keeping the human aspects aspects um, around us and um, making that um, more important than the, the, all the technologies around and everything that we have. Mm -hmm. Th those are true words of wisdom. <laughs> we really need that. Uh, a lot of people really need that security that you're not doing, that safety that even machines, even if the machines can do all of this, uh, you are still human and you're not going to be replaced. And uh, to answer to the question that Maria launched uh, at the end of the presentation, how do you imagine the newsroom of the future? I imagine them to be modern, but I would like them to be uh, not modern only in the infrastructure way, but also just reminding us um, journalists that we have to get out of the office. <laughs> so not as good that we want to sit <laughs> on our chairs for 10 hours because journalists have to go out and, and see that. And uh, newsrooms should really invest in the human experience, should really invest in the humans, like not only in the machines, but really how the journalists um, can behave to that, how the journalists can feel that 
they still own uh, everything, they still have the power. Um, so I think that is one of the questions when it comes to newsrooms, not everybody is willing to invest in their workers, uh, but it's, uh, that's something that will be very important. Um, so I, I hope this is a message of hope that we'll, uh, we'll keep for the end of the, um, of the discussion. I wanted to ask if you have any other uh, words to finalize, any other thoughts to finalize this discussion. No, thank you. I want to thank you guys um, for this moment here. I think we do have a lot of things to discuss. Um, those bring us a lot of food for thoughts. And I hope we can engage and keep going this discussion. Then again, um, keeping what matters. We are um, humans here and we need to um, be involved and be exchanging information and be in touch and building our network and bringing our human perspectives. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bruna. Maria? I'd like to thank you, you all. Thank you, Elena, Bruna, and, and everyone. And I think that this, this is the starting point to a conversation, right? So, uh, and this is this presentation, this discussion is the starting point to a conversation regarding the newsroom of the future, the human perspective. So I, invite you to to keep this conversation to keep this engagement thank you very much this is also what the association for repress wants to do for, uh, is to bring people back to the table to the discussion be it virtual be it live uh keep talking to the specialists and again this was a very useful session thank you very much for both of you and uh, we'll keep in contact